Welcome back to Rated Radio with your hosts, Raven Alexander and Shane Windham. Shane, what was Billboard's number one song this week? Well, if memory serves, it may have just been number two, but it was Bad Habits by Ed Sheeran. I think Stay by The Kid Leroy was still number mm-hmm. one, so we went ahead with number two. I'll talk about the song. How Maybe about that? You go right ahead. I, I love love listening. Not as emotionally affecting as those other songs I know Ed Sheeran for, but this is still a great song. It's Club Phil Vibes Bring the Weekend to Mind. The lyrics are strong for what they are. His voice is, as always, lovely, sounding like some combination of Jason Mraz and Wes Blaylock from Diaz Vale. Five stars. Yeah, I probably lean more towards the three star. Oh. Um, this is another for the youngins that do TikTok. We talk about this a lot. A lot of popular songs are either making their way to TikTok or coming from TikTok. And this is one of them. So I heard about it through TikTok first. And for some reason, it just doesn't resonate super well. That might be because of the the club feel. Yeah. So it, it gets a three for me. It's not a bad song. But I would probably be more apt to change it depending on what mood I'm in. Yeah. I think he's capable of five. It wouldn't rate as like a super strong five for me. Yeah. But I'd still give it credit as it deserves to be a hit. And it's pop. Yep. Popular. Anyway, enough about that. Let's get to talking about music after the intro. I'm kind of geeking out inside. I don't... I was going to say, you want to let the listeners know in case they already don't know based off the title of this episode, Mm -hmm. who did you pick in our Battle of the Bands? Queensryche. Of course. He's wearing his Queensryche shirt. He's he's ready. Which I debated a lot on having a handful of people come onto this episode Mm -hmm. because both bands were covering today very big artists Mm -hmm. in my life, but ultimately... I didn't want to overdo it, so... Well, I was interested in how you... I knew you were a fan of Dream Theater. That's going to be the other artist that we cover. But I never knew that apparently they're a part of... Both of them are a part of the big three as far as like progressive metal bands. Mm-hmm. Did that influence your decision at all to pick both of them? No. I don't remember why. I want to say the matchup is just because even... I don't think of their music as the same much at all, okay. but... For some reason in my head, they're just things You wanted a good week. Well, that and I do put them on the same pedestal. Okay. And quite a few people I've known don't agree. Okay. They think of Queensryche as a one-off band and most of them don't even know who Dream Theater is and if they've heard something, they couldn't care less, you know, so. Well, this is pretty much uncharted territory in every aspect. I think I knew one song from each, one from Queensryche because of my dad, one from you. I actually knew a lot more than I thought I did. Good. Getting to one of the albums that we covered. And again, it has a lot to do with my dad. So should we get into it? Yeah. The first album we covered was Rage for Order from 1986. This was my top album. This was my middle album. Out of the 11 tracks, I gave 11 fives. Yeah. I gave it three fives out of 11 tracks for anyone that cares. What was your top track? New Regal. Mine was The Killing Words. Bottom track was Surgical Strike. Same. I still gave Surgical Strike a five, but I do understand it's not something you might want to hear all the time. Yeah. I do still love the song. I know. No skirting that this is one of my top five all-time albums. If punk and rock had a royal category, this would top the pack. The emotional intelligence and lyrical depth on display here still floors me every time I listen. You're unlikely to hear as much juggling of political and romantic themes anywhere else. The production is astounding. This voice meeting this guitar has no equal in the music world. For me, it was theatrical 80s fantasy metal at its finest. You might disagree, Shane, because you're the expert here. Not my style for daily listening, but I can definitely see the appeal. Jeff Tate's vocals are incredibly interesting, and the musical accompaniment is not bad either. Word. Yeah. <laughs> Next album was Operation Mind Crime from 1988. 
This was my middle pick. This is my bottom album. Out of the 15 tracks, I gave 13 fives. I gave one five. One five. One five. Just making sure I got your fives in there. Okay. One. Thank you. I appreciate it. My top track was Sweet Sister Mary. And my top track was Spreading the Disease. I didn't write my bottom track down here, but going off of my ratings, I guess it would have to be the intro. I wrote any of the skits. <laughs> Fair enough. Just, just always can do without unless it's... It, I don't know. It has to really serve its purpose. And we will come back to that. Yes, we will. Uh, so one of the greatest concept albums ever released, which follows a young man in a mental institution and the story of how he wound up there. Not only does it go off hard on everything from government to cults, it also does so while spawning radio hits and remaining thematically consistent. Music like this undoubtedly influenced the likes of Rage Against the Machine and System of a Down, though this is more in line with hardcore 80s rock. A powerhouse album by any musical metric. It's epic. It's angsty. I just love it. And with regard to the what you categorized as skits, because it's a, a concept album mm -hmm. that's telling a story, mm -hmm. some of that is necessary. I think those sure. the first two tracks, you get like what is a vocal introduction to what's going on and then you get an instrumental yeah which always struck me as weird it's yeah. just right there at the beginning of the album where i think it kind of drops the ball yeah i agree i was going to say the first one was the first track on the album was going to be my bottom but this, you know so, some of them did better than others but still i could have did without the skits but i get that it's a concept album i guess it didn't just land with me Oh, a couple of things that I want to say about Operation Mindcrime. A lot more of Metal Floyd vibes in the beginning with this one. Think Floyd's The Wall. It can get a little bit cheesy. Some sounds and song structures are a little repetitive. And I want more range vocally after a while. Too many skits. Album should be shorter. And the last album that we covered was Empire from 1990. This was actually my bottom album. This was my top. Out of the 11 tracks, though... I gave 10 fives. Ooh, I gave five fives. Top track was Anybody Listening? My top track was Jet City Woman. Thank God it was not. Oh, I wrote second, Silent Lucidity. Of course you did. But Jet City Woman, I forgot that I knew that song. This is the album that my dad would play on repeat. Yeah. Uh, so it held a lot of nostalgia for me, and I forgot how good Jet City Woman was. What's your bottom track? Resistance. Really? Mm-hmm. It's Della Brown for me. Okay. I like it better than I thought I did. I used to have this argument with our Uncle Mike about whether or not Della Brown was a great track, because apparently it's one of his favorites from this album. I'm still giving it a four. But it would have been a perfect album had it not been it, for that one. It would have. This is their most mainstream sounding effort. Hilarious to me, too, that it also contains their biggest hit, which sounds almost nothing like the rest of the album no. or even the rest of anything we listen to from this group. I love Silent Lucidity. And that's the song we're talking about Yeah, you gave here. it a five. Yeah, but the group deserved to be a known entity for loads of other songs. The album itself is a mixed bag of goods. Mostly we get bombastic balladry with the pensive breaks in the wall of sound feeling less connected to one another than they previously had. It's a great disc full of what I consider their biggest hits, just not as impressive to me as the other albums we covered. I can agree. I mean, it was my top, but this I can definitely agree that it was their most mainstream, which is probably why it fell in my top ranking. Yeah, and it's not popular music mainstream. Mm -hmm. It's like rock yes. mainstream. Yes. It's very good mainstream. Yeah. <laughs> Any notes? Uh, yes. Uh, popular composer Michael Kamen is behind the orchestral arrangements on the albums. He was also on Pink Floyd's The Wall. So I made the Pink Floyd connection before I read that. So it just, you know, justified what I already thought for Operation Mindcrime. You definitely hear that, by the mm -hmm. way, in Operation Mindcrime yeah. versus like The Wall. Which, they, The Wall is a concept album. It is. So this that is makes a, sense. This is a better concept album. <laughs> don't get me wrong. Love Floyd. They were originally named The Mob, but... Their first demo song was titled Queens of the Reich, and their new manager suggested that they change the band's name based off of the song. So that's where the name Queens Reich came from. And unfortunately, they broke up due to creative differences in direction. Which, yes, they did. Which happens a lot. Uh, they have their lead singer tried to keep it going mm -hmm. forever. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of creative differences. Eventually, the guitarist left first. They got a new lead singer. They wound up kicking Jeff out, and they have three albums with the new lead singer. Yeah. And Jeff did 
one album that was titled Queen's Reich, and then there was a big legal feud, and now he's doing another side project that I can't think of the name of at the at the moment. I want to well, say it's like a lot, Shane. It's like Operation Mind Crime or something oh, okay. might be the name of the, All right. the fucking thing. Dropping my phone. <laughs> I wanted to mention that their warning album came out the day I was born. Oh. We didn't look cover at that, that today and I've mentioned that before. It just feels right. It does. It helps <laughs> Makes explain a lot of sense. helps explain my love of this in addition to the fact that both of my uncles who served as father figures for me were big into the group. Mm -hmm. It makes a, a very big difference. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call it bias because they still have fantastic music, you know. It's not like they're telling me, you know, a Timmy T album came out the day I was born. <sighs> oh God. It, it, <laughs> I wonder if a Timmy T album came out the day you were born, Raven. It that did. would be great. Oh, well, it might. I I like to go and look at like what song was popular. And I think mine was like Me Amore by... <laughs> That's such a good song. That Color Me Bad song? I think so. Man. Maybe. I might be wrong. But anyway. Anyway. You ready to take a break? Nope. You got more to say? Oh, All yeah. All right. You go. You go right ahead. You go, Glen Coco. So this group is... If you like Queensryche, also make sure you go hear Sabotage at some point. They're not the same group. But again, my brain ties them together. Okay. It's about as close as you get sound-wise to this group. Just remove most of the political overtones. Got it. And think more in line with Trans-Siberian Orchestra because obviously Sabotage, parts of them became... Trans-Siberian Orchestra? Yep. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Their biggest hit, Sarajevo, mm -hmm. or Christmas Eve, that was actually a Sabotage song on a Sabotage album <laughs> that wound up getting ported. To Trans-Siberian Orchestra and they mm -hmm. made, they're known for it now? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think bigger than any Sabotage song ever was. <laughs> so <laughs> the music makes me feel like a political manifesto is worth my writing. So yeah, definitely if you like political music, this is for you. Mm-hmm. I'm saying it next to artist. I just forgot I switched my papers. Okay. I'm in a weird space today. I feel you. You, fe you fed me curry. I did. It's delicious. It was good. Yeah. I think I liked the, I don't know why we're talking about this now, but I think I liked the Indian mm -hmm. curry. You like that better? Yeah. I think it's more my, sp I can eat good. more It's Good. Uh, it's more, you will find more variety. Okay. If that's your flavor palette. Wasn't there like orange, like curry, and then there's like yellow and, mm -hmm. okay. And red and green. And, okay. Yeah. I don't know, but the base of that is always coconut milk, so that always kind of comes through as the primary thing. Is it like add Indian a little food bit is, sweetness to it? Yeah. Okay. And Indian food is it's a little different. Yeah. So their most uh, back to Queens, right? <laughs> <laughs> their most recent albums boast a new lead singer who sounds much like their old lead singer. That's been a nice injection of renewed direction for the group as well. So definitely hear those albums. It's worth noting that people seem to either love or hate this group's vocals. Their twin guitarist sound is something I love from them as well as other personal faves like Blind Guardian and Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. What you're able to do with two guitars going at the same time obviously appeals to me. Love of complicated music. Mm -hmm. Shane likes it complicated. We talked about The Wall and Mind Crime. Yes. Going hand in hand, My Groom's Cake was a combination of Pink Floyd's The Wall album. And the Queen's Rack on top. It was... Yes. Yep. It was multi-leveled. And that's how highly I think of this group. Mm -hmm. I associate them with Pink Floyd in my head. We actually played their cover of Pink Floyd's Welcome to the Machine after our cake cutting. And what I'm saying here is go hear this band's music. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I've got. Are you ready to take a break? I'm ready to take a break. <laughs> Still keeping to the, you got to go find our top 10 lists on our Spotify, which we will. Or our social media. Or our social media. We will share it on social media. But Shane, why don't you tell the listeners, what was your top 10 list this week? Top vocal performances. I was not surprised. It sounded like a good idea because <laughs> Queen's right as one of my favorite vocalists. Mm -hmm. But I had a lot of trouble putting this list together. So I, yeah, I, I had. I had trouble. But then again, you know, I, and not every song selection can be Chris Stapleton. And uh, to spoil it a little bit, he did not make this list. 
See, but one thing I am enjoying about this is I feel encouraged to go look at your list now. Finally. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you, why don't you, uh, top 10 vocal performances. Give me a story. The story I went with for one of my picks was the song Come What May, the original film version. From Moulin Rouge. From Moulin Rouge. It was Ewan McGregor and Nicole Kidman singing yes. on the track. That's so good. This song is like time in a bottle with regard to my first deep dive into love with another human being, the highs, the lows, the naive notion that it would overcome everything, and the hopeful outlook I felt from rock bottom when it didn't overcome everything. It's all still there when this song plays. One of the hardest cries of my lifetime was while listening to this on a lunch break back when I was like 18. I remember knowing I was crying so hard because I'd finally accepted that that absolutely amazing part of my life was never going back to what it once was, what it had the potential to be. I was never the same after that. Just wasn't. Ask anyone. It's amazing that that's one of your picks and they're not vocal performers. They're actors. Yeah. That's really Nicole Kidman. That's really Ewan McGregor singing that song. I mean, it's got a great accompaniment. But beautiful voices, beautiful harmonization. Nice. And I uh, just wanted to say that I'm honestly grateful that I can at least still hear and feel so clearly the reminder of who I was before first having my heart broken. All right. What do you have for us, Rayburn? My song is Fallen by Alicia Keys. How about Rayburn? Rayburn. Like Taylor says. Rayburn. I love it. He's the only one that calls me that. Falling. Fallen by Alicia Keys. As far back as I can remember, I used to crave an audience. I know. Sit back down, Shane. He wasn't standing up. Big surprise. I know. Whether it was to make them laugh or to make them forget even just a little while, I always had no issue with making a spectacle out of myself for someone's amusement. But I can even remember as a youngin performing this for my family in our living room during late hours, never being able to be confident enough to take it on properly. I carry that doubt still to this day, but it never stops my family from encouraging me to sing it every chance they got. Are you going to go ahead and perform that for us right now? Nope. Oh. All right. Nice try. Well, I guess that's the end of our break. We will see you in a moment to talk about the one and only Dream Theater. I have to say, I'm genuinely curious now. The Queen's Reich stuff didn't really surprise me. You're looking at my paper. I'm not looking at your Back paper. Up. I can't even see you with can't all read the, upside down. There's tons of pink highlighter everywhere <laughs> and it it just prevents me from seeing words. Okay, good. So this isn't as out there as some of the stuff that I could make you endure. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm curious. Your toes in the water here. Uh -huh. So Move, Dream get, Theater. Get on with it. First album we covered was Images and Words from 1992. This was my top album. This was my middle album. Out of the eight tracks, I gave eight fives. I feel like it's evolving. <laughs> and you, Rayburn? Rayburn gave it two fives out of eight tracks. My top track was Metropolis Part One. That was my bottom track. Okay. <laughs> My top track was Surrounded. It's another great song. I was going to say, well, you all think they're great. Did I redeem myself a little bit? Well, I I did think of your top track highly enough to write about it in my novel. So All right. Yeah. Sweet. I didn't have a bottom track. Not surprising. And we already know yours. Yes. This album shares both sound and stylistic similarities to Rush's late 80s work. Its messaging and heart, however, keep me thinking of Queensryche's Empire era. You'll notice the bass mostly aids the drums, while the keys aid the guitar, which is a sound I live for. It changed how I hear music and remains one of my favorite LPs. Vocals are easy to understand for metal. I think we have more than established, if you've been a long-time listener, that metal is very touch-and-go with me. Progressive rock. Metal. Pro I have progressive metal. <laughs> Written that's down. that's fair. Instrumentals are interesting. Everything seems very intended on this album and very in sync. And I'm not talking Justin Timberlake. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I remember having the disc for the first time. And for the first time, that's the only way you could hear music back then was to have the disc. <laughs> for the first time. But, you know, sometimes someone would hand you a CD or a burnt copy of something. Yeah. And you don't get the full inserts and everything where you can yeah. open it up. The full experience. Yes. And you open it up and it's pictures of them in the studio working on the album. Mm -hmm. And that just, like, I think about that every time I hear it. Just the, Those pictures? Yes. Nice. Amazing. <laughs> I don't know what it looks like. 
Well, someday maybe you will. Maybe. I don't know. Sorry about my life. Next album we covered was Awake from 1994. This was my bottom album. This was also my bottom album. But out of the 11 tracks, I gave 10 fives. I gave it two fives. My top track was Space Divest. My top track was The Silent Man. My bottom track was The Silent Man. <laughs> <laughs> my bottom track was Lie. A bit heavier and almost gothic, where keys are concerned, this was actually my introduction to the group. It takes risks, and they mostly pay off. I love the use of recorded conversations in the songs, and how fearlessly it stays in the deep end of the lyrical pool throughout. Not as even or whimsical as images and words, but it's still a very worthwhile ride, apart from The Silent Man. <laughs> For me, some songs are slower to get into than others. Like The Silent Man. Like The Silent Man. They add more keyboard this go around, and that is all I have to say about that. Which, if you like the keys in this album, then Chroma Key is right up your alley. How many times are you going to plug Chroma Key? This Man, episode? until they're a thing. Okay. I don't understand how they're not a bigger thing. Shane is single-handedly going to make Chroma Key's following. Like, well, Chroma double. Key is just the keyboardist from this part of Dream Theater's era. Yeah. It's their keyboardist. He's doing his own music. So all of that, like, conversations Why he in go the by music. His name? He did eventually for, like, okay. a soundtrack. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Anyway. You know more than I do. Final album we covered was A Dramatic Turn of Events from 2011. This was my middle album. This is my top album. Out of the nine tracks, I gave nine fives. Beep, 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 beep. Rayburn did not because there are a lot of long songs here. I gave five fives. Thank Damn. you. Huh. Five out five of nine? Five out of nine in your face. Jesus. My top track was Breaking All Illusions. My top track was Beneath the Surface. I always want to say that's my top track, but it's just the emotional sap in me that wants to say that. Okay. Like the, the music on a lot of the other songs is better, and I know it, and that's why I said Breaking All Illusions. Anyway, bottom track was Far From Heaven. My bottom track was Lost, Not Forgotten. That's a damn shame. But who knows? Maybe it grows on you after a while. Maybe. We've, we've discovered this about me. At this point in the discography, the keyboardist and drummer have changed. The band might actually be stronger for it, too. Tall order, considering my obsession with the X members. Uh, but this might be their most accessible album. And it is still very much prog at heart. I can't talk today. <laughs> this disc juggles emotional states better than the others we've covered. Its musical indulgence is reminiscent of my favorite Tool songs. If I have to nitpick, their vocalist doesn't affect me consistently, but I still have trouble imagining anyone else taking the reins. Uh, this is another must hear for our more serious listeners. The guitar accompaniment is the most compelling throughout this album. This is more epic. Songs still run a little bit long, in my opinion, which is weird because they'd have like a really long song and then a really short song, mm -hmm. a really long song and a really short song. I had the pleasure of seeing John Petrucci, who is the lead guitarist for Dream Theater, in concert. And he was amazing and hilarious. I saw Dream Theater live. I haven't seen John on his own. I was going to go with my mom at one point. Mm -hmm. There was somebody else he was playing with that she wanted to see really bad. When we went, they were doing like uh, three of the best guitarists or whatever. It was him and uh, Joe Satriani and then mm -hmm. somebody else. And I, for the life of me, I can't remember who it was. But yeah, damn good show. And he was so funny. Well, Cracked it, me up. That doesn't come as a surprise. As a group, you don't hear John talk at all. Mm -hmm. It's all the lead vocalist. Yeah. But what we did get straight out of the gate was they come out and they start playing. It was during this album's era. Yeah. And they come out and they start going. And you see him like kicking shit on stage because his guitar is not actually playing. Like yeah. they don't have the volume turned up on his guitar. Yeah. And like somebody throws something back at it. I don't know. They were just, they were playing around. You could tell he wasn't pissed off about yeah. it. He just seemed like a nice guy about mm -hmm. the whole thing. He did this really cool mashup of a bunch of either different songs and different theme songs and the way he made them all flow so well together. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. So related acts... There are a lot of them, but definitely here the one I talk about a lot for fuck's sake. I, won't, key? I wasn't going to say the name okay, again, but I'll do it for you. Their original debut album had a different vocalist. Uh, it's called When Dream and Day Unite. And it's probably why you can't find it on streaming services is because they have a different vocalist. But if you like 
Journey's lead singer, Uh you might really love that album. Just imagine Journey doing their original prog rock type thing Mm -hmm. with the newer vocalist. All right. Because they did change when when Steve Perry came along. Yeah. Music makes me feel like I'm Dr. Manhattan from Watchmen. All right. Any notes? Nothing? Oh, no. I I have some. I'm just waiting. Oh, I'm going to let you go and then I'll talk a little bit more. My first experience with Dream Theater was, of course, Shane. Had no idea who Dream Theater was. And my best experience was seeing John Petrucci in concert. I would recommend Dream Theater to any metal or guitar fan. Original name for Dream Theater was Majesty, and they changed it due to another band being called the same name. And when the other band that was called the same name threatened to take legal action, I mean, nobody wants to get sued. Every member besides the vocalists attended Berkeley College, and they started covering Rush and Iron Maiden songs. So that's how they got their start. John, I can't pronounce his last name, John... Mayung? Mayung. The bassist? Yeah. And John Petrucci are the only two constant members. Mike, what, Portnoy? Yeah. The drums? He took a break in 2010. He also started a different music group. Like, almost everybody who's gone off on their own has... Done gone, something else. They've done great things, mm-hmm. but... Anyway, I think some people out there, I didn't write this down, but there may be some people who know Dream Theater from the Metropolis Part 2 album, and it is also a concept album, and you may be confused as to why I didn't pick it here today. Mm -hmm. Let's just say that's the direction I wanted to go and leave it at that. Okay. And maybe in the future, we'll talk about that album. We're not talking about it today. And I apologize to those of you who really love that album. Not today. We will have another opportunity, I'm sure. Not today. I want to say that this group has very strong fives. And I think even after various lineup changes, that they're one of the most talented groups of all time. That they're not more popular really is an indictment of mainstream sounds lacking depth. So who took it for you? That would be Queensryche. Who do you think took it for me? Dream Theater. Yeah, that second uh, Queensryche album hurt their overall average for me. But yeah, definitely Dream Theater. And Dream Theater only had three-fourths the amount of music. So even though Dream Theater has what I believe in a multi-album situation is my highest average of all time, beating out Queensryche, (laughs) I mean, Queensryche had more fives. So that's my winners. What are you going to do? There's no real loser here. No, there isn't. Still gonna still gonna go into our bracket for Battle of the Bands. You never know what might happen. I think that that has more than proven in the past five seasons that anything can happen in the Battle of the Bands. So yep. it was a good week. Again, if you can't tell, I absolutely love these groups. <laughs> Let's move on to our draw yep. for what will be coming in the next few weeks. Yeah. All right. Well, okay. Just so everyone what? knows what's oh. different about this season, if your name comes out of the jar your name will not come out of the jar again during this season. So we're trying to give more people opportunities. Okay. I'm pretty sure this is a country week because <laughs> okay. Jennifer contributed. It's Cody Jinx. Going up against... Whiskey Myers. Was that was Cody Jinx one of her top 10? Yes. Cody Jinx. have no idea who that is. My Aunt Jennifer is obsessed with... Texas country. So that's what I'm guessing this is. She's consistently told me I need to go listen to it, to all these Texas country artists. Mm -hmm. You want to go down that rabbit hole? There's some other people out there who we could name that are definitely Texas country fans. So it's not about whether or not I want to go down that rabbit hole. We're going down that rabbit hole. We're going down that rabbit hole. So we will see you again in a few weeks, right? Yeah. Listeners. Yep. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Hey, we we always have a dedicated you know, country artist like every season. Sometimes it happens more than once. But if Cody Jinx is our designated country artist, let him be our designated country mm-hmm. artist. That's going to do it for this week. Hit up our playlist on Spotify, visit our merch shop, and share our show with your friends. Come find us on social media to let us know what you think. And until next time, fill your world with music. Go listen to Chroma Key or I Hate You. Mm-hmm.